Nice, nice. All right. All jokes aside, let's get let's get serious. We're gonna be like Joseph today. We're gonna get in here and do some worship. You ready, Joseph? Uh, see, he's running to the altar. That's what I'm talking about. Come on, dude. Get fine. All right. So here we go. Father God, we thank you so much, Father, for the Son. We thank you so much for his sacrifice on the cross, Father, and so much for his resurrection, Lord. Thank you so, so much. Father, I pray that uh, as we give an offering today, Father, of worship and praise to how good and awesome you are and how thankful we are because you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, Father. There's nothing that you can't put in uh, underneath your feet. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. up to the front. Let's worship. The power of death is broken. Just one touch and I am changed from your lips. My true name you've spoken. You're calling out who I've always been. I'm taking off my crown. Sing. 
I'm gonna sing it till I meet it Till all my doubts have been defeated I'm gonna sing it till I meet it You're gonna see this dead man walk I'm gonna sing it till I meet it Till all my doubts have been defeated I'm gonna sing it till I mean it You're gonna see this dead man walk I'm gonna sing it till I mean it Till all my doubts have been defeated I'm gonna sing it till I mean it You're gonna see this dead man walk I'm gonna sing it till I mean it Till all my doubts have been defeated I'm gonna sing it till I mean it you're going to see this dead man walk. You're going to see this dead man walk. I'm taking off my grave clothes. I'm putting on righteousness. I'm taking off my grave clothes. I'm putting on resurrection. I'm taking off my grave clothes. I'm putting on righteousness. I'm taking off my grave clothes. I'm putting on resurrection. I'm putting on resurrection. Thank you. 
Come on, sing that again. The way, the truth, the life. Come on. I believe you are the way, the truth, the life. Oh, I believe you are. I believe you are. I believe you are. There's nothing that.
there's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no come on, sing this again. me 
Can we get that one more time? But I would really, really love to hear every voice in this building echo this, this right here.
Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord, Father. I have the image of, of the the empty tomb and the disciples just hiding inside that room, not knowing what to do. Then they finally, the bell went off in their heads and they realized the power wasn't in Jesus himself. It was in the word. It was in his message that he had to go and spread. And he gave that power to us. He said, go and make more disciples. The power's in the word, man. And I thank you for the resurrection. Give us that, that light. Give us that power. We have that same power. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Father. We do this all for you, Father. We thank you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, worship team. Let's get to the next part of our worship service, which is tithes and offerings. Ushers, while we're gathering up our tithes and offerings, we're going to do a nugget real quick with my wonderful son, Joseph Andrew Payne. Come on up, Mr. Payne. Pray over tithes and offerings real quick. Father God, we thank you, Father, for provision. We thank you, Lord, for uh, entrusting us with the... that seed, Father, I pray that we sow the seed where you tell us to, Father, and I pray that it's into this ministry that we be good stewards of uh, every seed, Father, that we plant it exactly where you want it, when you want it, and how you want it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Here's Andrew Payne. Give him a hand. Um, so I, I got this idea for a nugget. Um, I kind of been battling on a, on two ideas, and uh, the other day my my son was really wanted to watch uh, God's Not Dead before uh, it left uh, one of the one of the streaming services that we have, and uh, he only got like probably like thirty minutes into it, but he had asked me the question of in God's Not Dead. If I ever felt like I had to uh, prove the existence of God, and my instinct was no, you know, never had to do that. And then the more that I thought about it, I realized that I do. Um, kind of give a little backstory uh, with my childhood. Um, I've been, uh, I have my white family and I have my Hispanic family. And the funny thing is, is sometimes you feel like you're not very good for either side. Sometimes you don't feel, I'm not Mexican enough on this side, and I'm not white enough on this side. It's like, I like spicy food, but I don't speak Spanish. I can't stand mac and cheese either. <laughs> so, I have a hard time. And, I, and instead of me trying to to figure out what side I wanted to be on, I eventually just became my own person and just embraced who I was. Um, I understand that I, I speak un poquito espanol, and I also speak redneck. <laughs> um, and Jesus spoke to this. It says that you cannot serve two masters. So for me whenever I thought about God's not dead and, and proving his existence, I told my son that we prove his existence every day by choosing our actions. That, for example, if my wife does not exist, then I don't have to respect her. Right? If my parents don't exist, then I don't have to honor them. If my neighbor doesn't exist, then I don't have to treat them with kindness. Right? 
Every day, I have to prove the existence of God just by simply being who I am. It's very difficult because um, I'm sure, as y'all know, that my mother shared a story on Facebook where my neighbor decided to tear down the, uh, the barrier in between our two houses while we were at church. It's not a very happy person that day. Probably didn't show Christ very well. That day I chose not to choose that he existed. That day I chose to prove to my neighbor that he didn't exist. That whenever I'm at work and I want to respond like my other workers, I'm telling my, my workers that he doesn't exist in my life. There's a sign that we like to put in a lot of Christian doorways. And um, we like to point out the scripture, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. This is Joshua twenty four fifteen. But the whole scripture says, And if it seems evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you, do, you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. In a day like today, where we get to celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we can either go back to who we were before and serve Him that way, or we can choose this day to serve the risen King and the Lord of Lords. Thank you, Mr. Payne. Good morning. You guys want to get the communion ready, please? You got enough pops? I mean to, to pass out. Okay. We're going to take communion this morning. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning uh, to honor you, to take part in uh, what you did with the disciples, showing them that this was your body and this was your blood, and then that we're to partake of it, to be one with you. Father, open our hearts to receive. Father, help us right now to... Think of every, anything that, that has a separation between you and us. Let us ask for forgiveness. You are faithful to forgive. Let us cleanse ourselves this morning. As they did before they came into the Holy of Holies. They washed their hands and they washed their feet. We are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, and we've accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. But every day we commit transgressions against you. And every day we need to come and wash our feet and wash our hands by asking for forgiveness of those sins, Father. And so we do that right now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. Uh, go with me to Matthew chapter 26. First. Let's go... Uh, Verse 26. Matthew 26, 26. We're good? Awesome. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat this. This is my body. Y'all go ahead and pass out. Oh, we're going to come up and get it? Okay. Come on. Everybody come up. Explain to me. Did you get mine? No. Okay, just go sit down. Just go sit down. Just go sit down. Just go sit down.
Can someone take the, the guys in the booth? You got it? All right. Did your son leave? But with him, but it's always hers. They are y'all's doing. I'm going to go to hell when I'm thinking. Come on, beautiful. Yeah. Oh, Lord, we have gotten off, off the rails. I oh, know. We were holy there for two seconds. Okay, let's read it again. Uh, Matthew 26, 26, and it says, As they were eating, Jesus took the bread and blessed it and broke it. And gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is, this is my body. And then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, drink ye all of it, for this is the blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Normally I do each par- portion at each time, but as I was sitting there today, I felt the emphasis and the impression of the Lord that, we need to realize that we're taking his body, that it's not actually his body in our reality since it is a representation of his body as we take this word. And in that, we consume it and it becomes part of us. And in the, it is the same as we need to take the word of God, consume it, and let it become part of us. Amen? That it becomes uh, all that we are. And and and. As I have asked you to to think about those things that are the transgressions. See, Jesus came, and if he didn't have the word and the power of the Holy Spirit, it would just be another religion. But 
He came to give us life and to give us life more abundantly and to operate and be like him. He's like no other God. He says, I want you to come and stand beside me. I want to be in you and you in me. I don't want to be up towering above you, though I am almighty and I am all, all, all powerful. I I love you so much. I want you to be part of me. And so in that, that access to that being part of him is through the blood, which is, uh, which is the wine, which is the Holy Spirit, and is the, the bread, which is the, the food. As we take, partake the food, and as we partake the wine, we become like him. But it enables us to walk in his power and be like him, to be sons. So this morning, let's take the bread, and in remembrance of him, take and eat. Dear Heavenly Father, my prayer this morning is, is that we would not just be eating a cracker. That we would understand the type and shadow. That as we consume your word, as it becomes one with us, it causes us to walk like you, be like you, to love like you, to sacrifice like you. to have power like you, to truly be sons and daughters of the Most High God. Amen. And then the blood. The life is in the blood. The Holy Spirit is the power. It is what brought him back to life. It is what gave him the power to do the miracles. It is what gives us the power to be like him. the, The Holy Spirit is the difference between words on a page and living and walking and being like Jesus Christ. Amen. Take ye and drink this, his blood. Let's bow our heads one more time. Dear Heavenly Father, as we consume this grape juice as a representation of your blood, Father, let today be different than any other day that we've ever taken communion. Let today be the day, Father, that we allow the Word and the Holy Spirit to come Uh, joined together within our hearts. Take us to faith that we've never had before. Get us to extend our hand in faith like never before. To step out of the boat and walk on the water. To raise the dead. To open the ears. To preach the gospel to thousands. And see them saved, Father God. And allow us to be truly intimate with you. Face to face, mouth to mouth. Let today be the day that we be changed forever. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen and amen. Uh, Pass your cups down to the end of the row. Here. And then whoever got those, hand it to the ushers. Okay, you got to quit passing that cute baby around. He's distracting me. He is so cute. God. Yeah, he doesn't look like neither one of them. Thank God. <laughs> they can't deny that baby. Look at him. Uh, take them gloves off his hand. Let him be real. Well, he'll learn to forget. He'll learn to stop. He'll go. Ow, that hurts. Oh yeah, I need to stop doing that. <laughs> Y'all give him my hand as he comes forward. Some of y'all got spiritual gloves on your hand. You don't even know it. (laughs) Good morning. Hallelujah. He has risen. He has been raised from the dead. Praise God. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead determines the nature of Christianity. We are the only religion where the center person has been raised from the dead. No other faith has what we have. If you take away the resurrection, you take away Christianity. It is the centerpiece of our message of faith. It is an incomplete gospel if you stop at the cross. You've got to continue through resurrection. And so often we stop at the cross. 
Because we understand pain. We understand suffering. But we don't get resurrection life in its fullness. Dying was simply not enough for Jesus. He had to rise again. And the resurrection is still incomplete if the message of the resurrection isn't sent. So those three things we're going to talk about this morning. We're going to talk about the cross. We're going to talk about the resurrection. But we're also going to talk about the mission or the sending of the word of God. Now, I have a lot of scriptures today. And last week, I gave you, what, four little bitty scriptures. <laughs> One. So today, I'm giving you a lot. So I'm taking what I didn't use last week, and I'm using it this week. And nobody gets to roll their eyes or, you know, make a sigh, okay? Everybody got it? But my prayer is honestly that at the end of this, your heart will be stirred and that um, you will uh, just feel the presence of Jesus and you're, you'll want to share um, Jesus every day of your life. I'm going to need my glasses. Sorry, I should have grabbed this first. Oh, all right, so we're going to go to Romans chapter 3. I'm going to be reading from the Passion Translation today and the Amplified, and then we'll have the message one time. But um, So uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 21 through 26. I'll get there. says, But now, independently of the law, the righteousness of God is tangible and brought to light through Jesus, the Anointed One. This is the righteousness that the scriptures prophesied would come. It is God's righteousness made visible through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. And now all who believe in him receive that gift. For there is really no difference between us. For we all have sinned and are in need of the glory of God. Can you say amen? Uh, yet through his powerful declaration of acquittal, God freely gives away his righteousness. His gift of love and favor now cascades over us, all because Jesus, the anointed one, has liberated us from the guilt, punishment, and power of sin. Jesus' God-given destiny was to be the sacrifice to take away sins, and now he is our mercy seat because of his death on the cross. We come to him for mercy, for God has made a provision for us to be forgiven by faith in the sacred blood of Jesus. Woo, isn't that good scripture right there? Amen. Let's go turn over to Romans chapter 5. The cross is so important. It brings us back into fellowship uh, with Jesus. Romans chapter 5, verse 6. It would have been easier if I wrote all these down. But All right. So we're going to read 6 through 10. It says, uh, For when the time was right, the anointed one came and died to demonstrate his love for sinners who were entirely helpless, weak, and powerless to save themselves. Now who of us would dare to die for the sake of a wicked person? We can all understand if someone was willing to die for a truly noble person. But Christ proved God's passionate love for us by dying in our place while we were still lost and ungodly. And there is still much more to say of his unfailing love for us. For through the blood of Jesus, we have heard the powerful declaration, you are now righteous in my sight. And because of the sacrifice of Jesus, you will never experience the wrath of God. That is some good, good news. So if while we were still enemies, God fully reconciled us to himself through the death of his son, then something greater than friendship is ours. Now that we are, in a, we are at peace with God, and because we share in his resurrection life, how much more we will be rescued from sin's dominion. Woo, that's good scripture. By the blood and sacrifice of Jesus, the penalty for sin was paid for all time. Wow. There will never, ever, ever need to be another payment. What Jesus did is enough. He paid it for all of it. Even the things you're going to do in the future that you don't, re you don't even 
know about and you aren't even aware of. The cross is everything to us because it freed us from the law of sin. But we cannot just live with that reality. (laughs) Because if we don't actually experience the cross and not just know it, but we have to continue. And Jesus tells us that we are to receive his cross for the payment, but we're supposed to take up our own cross to live with him, right? So go to Luke chapter 14, verse 25 through 27 in the Message Bible. Are you with me? All right. It says, one day when large groups of people were walking along with him, Jesus turned and told them, anyone who comes to me but refuses to let go of father, mother, spouse, children, brothers, sisters, yes, even one's own self can't be my disciple. Anyone who won't shoulder his own cross and follow behind me can't be my disciple. It's easy for the church to just acknowledge Jesus' cross, but to never take up the cross for themselves. And there are two crosses involved in our faith. There is the cross of Jesus and the cross that you and I have to bear by sacrificing everything we are to it. Luke, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 8 in the Amplified, in verse 34. This is large print, so I can see this puppy right here. Hallelujah. They need to make a large print passion. It says, And Jesus called to him the throng with his disciples and said to them, If anyone intends to come after me, let him deny himself, forget, ignore, disown, and lose sight of himself and his own interests. Ow. You know why that's painful? Because that's a cross. (laughs) The cross is not a feel-good message. And he says, if you don't do that and take up his cross and join him as a disciple, siding with his party and follow with me, cleaving continually, steadfastly to me, for whoever wants to save his higher spiritual eternal life will lose it. And whoever gives up his life, which has lived only on earth for my sake and the gospels, will save it. For what does it profit to gain the whole world and forfeit his life, or for a man? For what can a man give as an exchange for his blessed life in the eternal kingdom of God? For whoever is ashamed here and now of me and my words in this adulterous, unfaithful, and preeminently sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory, splendor, and majesty of his Father with the holy angels. See, we have to embrace our cross. If we don't embrace our cross, then we cannot serve God. And it's so easy to, to, just to embrace his and not take on our own. I remember when we were youth pastors, uh, Ricky did a message one time, and he talked about how, um, you know, uh, when we think about uh, corporal punishment, we think about the electric chair or lethal injection. And so could you imagine walking around with the electric chair on your necklace or a syringe? It's not as beautiful, is it? But we see the cross as an adornment. We like to wear it on our jewelry. And it has lessened in the brevity of it because we don't understand that the cross equals death. It is not some faraway thing. It should be the thing nearest to us because every day we've been called to pick up our own and follow after him. We have to have the cross, but that can't be where we stop. Amen? Y'all okay? I know, it's lots of scripture. All right, Matthew chapter 28. Let's look at the resurrection. If I was to read every single... um, account of the resurrection of Jesus, we would be here a long time. But we are not going to do that today. (laughs) I'll spare you. But Matthew 28, we're going to read this first one here. 
uh, verses 1 through 10 because I love it and I got the microphone. Okay, so uh, Matthew 28 verse 1 says, Now after the Sabbath, near dawn of the first day of the week, Mary of Magdala uh, and the other Mary went to take a look at the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled the boulder back and sat upon it. His appearance was like lightning and his garments as white as snow. And those keeping guard were so frightened at the sight of him that they were agitated and they trembled and became like dead men. <laughs> but the angel said to the woman, do not be alarmed and frightened for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen as he said he would do. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they left the tomb hastily with fear and great joy and ran to tell the disciples. And as they went, behold, Jesus met them and said, hail, <laughs> greetings, what's up? <laughs> And they went to him and clasped his feet and worshiped him. And then Jesus said to them, do not be alarmed and afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go into Galilee and there they will see me. Oh, that's so good. Let's look at Luke chapter 24. Verse 49. Jesus says, and behold... I will send forth upon you what my father has promised, but remain in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Then he conducted them as far as Bethany and lifting up his hands, he invoked a blessing on them. And it occurred that while he was blessing them, he parted from them and was taken up into heaven. And they worshiping him went back to Jerusalem with great joy and they were continually in the temple celebrating with praises and blessing and extolling God. I want to reiterate something that we cannot disconnect the resurrection from the Spirit of God. Everything about resurrection has to do with Holy Spirit. It was the Spirit of God that raised Jesus up from the dead. It was the Spirit of God that's going to be released on the 50th day after this, after Jesus is appearing to man. He's going to release the Holy Spirit as he promised, and he said, you are going to be clothed with power from on high. So he, we have to realize that the Spirit of God is the resurrection of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So living a resurrected life is living life in the Holy Spirit. It's living life governed and led by the Spirit of God. Because if it's, listen, when you think resurrection, oftentimes your brain goes to the day you die. You immediately begin to think about the day you're going to go home to be with Jesus. Because resurrection to us is when I die, I'll resurrect. D oh, death, where is your sting, right? I'm no longer going to have to be, in, I'm not going to be in the grave. I'm going to be alive with Christ forever. But beloved, eternity doesn't start when you die. Eternity in Christ begins when you're born again. So you literally are as resurrected as Christ is in the spirit. What happens when you die is your body becomes as resurrected as your spirit. If you were living like a resurrected person, legit, how would you look? That's how we're supposed to be living. Because the Spirit of God is the resurrection of Jesus, and that same Spirit lives and dwells in this mortal body. So when we speak re resurrection, we're also speaking the Spirit. Now, in Acts chapter 2, Peter, when he's full of the Spirit of God, and we read the account of, um, the, uh, of Pentecost, 
Peter begins to preach a sermon and he's explaining what's going on. So let's just go there real quick and look at a few scriptures. Acts chapter 2, verses 14 oh, through 18. This needs to get bigger. All right, he says, Peter stood up with the 11 apostles and shouted. Remember, the wind came, flames of fire came down upon each one. A tongue uh, was released over each one, and they began to speak in other languages. And everybody in Jerusalem heard a sound. There was something. It wasn't just for the spiritual ears. People literally heard the sound of the Spirit being released in the upper room. And then they began to see the outpouring and the, and, and Peter and the disciples, all of them speaking in tongues, and they began to say that they must be drunk, right? So Peter is now going to respond to them. And it says he stood up with the 11 apostles and shouted to the crowd, listen carefully, my fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. You need to clearly understand what's happening here. These people are not drunk like you think they are. For if it was only nine o'clock in the morning, this is the fulfillment of what was prophesied through the prophet Joel. For God says, this is that I, this is what I will do in the last days. I will pour out my spirit on everybody and cause your sons and daughters to prophesy. And your young men will see visions and your old men will experience dreams from God. The Holy Spirit will come upon all of my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. Amen. Right? So go down to verse 22. It says, Peter continued, people of Israel, listen to the facts. Jesus the victorious was a man on a divine mission whose authority was clearly proven. For you know how God performed many miracle, powerful miracles, signs, and wonders through him. This man's destiny was prearranged for God knew that Jesus would be handed over to you to be crucified and that you would execute him on a cross by the hands of lawless men. Yet, it was all part of his predetermined plan. God destroyed the cords of death and raised him up because it was impossible for death's power to hold him prisoner. So Peter's saying, look, yes, you crucified him. Yes, he died, but he's victorious over the grave. He has risen again. Oh, it's such good news. This changes everything. The disciples are experiencing the power of the Spirit of God, and they are now moving in signs and miracles and wonders. Think about it. 60 days prior to this, they were wavering, confused, back and forth. Peter denied. They were not confident. They continued to ask Jesus, well, I gave up. I gave up my career. Am I going to get something back? You know what I mean? Because everything was being challenged. Everything. They went from being waver, wavering, teeter-tottering, unstable, not super confident about Jesus, crying because he was crucified, not understanding what happened, to be the most bold, radical, absolutely unafraid people who would lay hands on the sick and they would recover. They were raising people from the dead. They were, they were doing miracles upon miracles upon miracles. What happened to these people? Resurrection life happened. That's it. They went from cowering to towering in a moment. Peter was so bold, he went from running away from Jesus in denial to willingly being arrested, knowing that in the morning his head was going to be cut off. Watching his friend's head cut off the evening before. And not moved. Sleeping so hard, an angel had to kick him. You think you'd be sleeping that hard if you knew someone's going to whack your head off the next morning? In resurrection life, you are. That's all that happened. The Spirit of God. Oh. Do you realize that Spirit is in you? Let's 
go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I think I'm done. Oh, I think I'm done with the Amplified. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is Paul's message of resurrection. We're going to read a lot of it, but we're not going to read all of it. Let's look at verses 1 through 8. It says, Dear friends, let me give you clearly the heart of the gospel that I've preached to you, the good news that you have heartily received and on which you stand. For it is through the revelation of the gospel that you are being saved. If you fasten your life firmly to the message I've taught you, unless you have believed in vain. For I have shared with you what I have received and what is of utmost importance. The Messiah died for our sins, fulfilling the prophecies of the scriptures. He was buried in the tomb and was raised from the dead after three days, as foretold in scriptures. Then he, he appeared to Peter, the rock, and to the 12 apostles. He also appeared to more than 500 of his followers at the same time. <laughs> there are so many conspiracy theories about what happened to Jesus. Some people say that they um, removed his body. Uh, some people say that the apostles took it to, um, you know, fool everybody. Some people say that Jesus was not technically all the way dead. I have a problem with that because if you got that much beating and you were that horribly and brutally um, accosted by these people and then you were hanging on a cross and your side was speared and um, then you get into a tomb and you're tightly wrapped with all of these grave clothes on you, but then you had the strength to get up, unwrap yourself, and then move a two-ton rock that's in front of it. I have a problem with that being near death. So, um, But there's so many conspiracy theories, but the problem is there are more historical texts of people who saw Jesus than Julius Caesar. Do you believe Julius Caesar was alive on the earth? There's more proof that Jesus was here than Julius Caesar. And we question. He appeared to more than 500 follow of his followers at the same time, most of whom are still alive as I write this, though a few have passed away. Then he appeared to Jacob and to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared in front of me like one born prematurely ripped from the womb. Yes, I am the most insignificant of all the apostles, unworthy even to be called an apostle because I hunted down believers and persecuted God's church. Wow. Jesus was showing himself to so many people, it energized the church. It was undeniable. They could not stop what God was doing through the men and women who were filled with the Spirit. Thousands upon thousands were being added to the church daily all because the Spirit of God fell at Pentecost. Let's look at verse, uh, verse 12 in 1 Corinthians 15. It says, The message we preach is Christ, who has been raised from the dead. So how could any of you possibly say there is no resurrection of the dead? For if there's no such thing as a resurrection from the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, all of our preaching has been for nothing, and your faith is useless. Wow. Those are bold words. Moreover, if the dead are not raised, that would mean that we are false witnesses who are misrepresenting God, and that would mean that we have preached a lie stating that God raised him from the dead if, in reality, he didn't. What is Paul telling us? He's saying, look... If you take away the resurrection, you take away Christianity. It is everything to us. If Christ didn't die and if Christ wasn't raised, nothing is true. It's all for nothing. We could all go live our lives the way we want and do whatever. Now let's look. Oh, let's keep going there. 
It says, if the dead aren't raised up, that would mean that Christ has not been raised up either. And if Christ is not alive, you are still lost in your sins and your faith is a fantasy. It would also mean that those believers in Christ who have passed away have simply perished. Think about that. If this is a lie, then everybody that we always say, oh, they're in a better place and we'll see them again one day, hogwash. It's a good thing Jesus is alive. If the only benefit of our hope is in Christ is limited to this life on earth, we deserve to be pitied more than all others. Wow. Wow. But the truth is, Christ is risen from the dead as the first fruit of the great resurrection harvest of those who have died. For since death came through a man, Adam, it is fitting that the resurrection of the dead has also come through a man, Christ. Even as all who are in Adam die, so all who are in Christ will be made alive. But each one in his proper order, Christ, the first fruits, then those who belong to Christ in his presence. Hallelujah. Go to verse 45. There's so much in this chapter. It's amazing. He says, for it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became the life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual didn't come first. The natural precedes the spiritual. The first man was made from the dust of the earth. The second man is the Lord Jehovah from the realm of heaven. The first one made from dust has a race of people just like him who are also made from dust. And the one sent from heaven has a race of heavenly people who are just like him. That is us. We are just like him. We carry his likeness now. We are from heaven. You are not of this earth any longer. You have been resurrected with Christ Jesus. Woo! That should get you happy. We are crucified with Christ, and thus we are resurrected with Christ. Not going to be one day. We are right now. We are as resurrected as Jesus Christ. And we can have as much power of that resurrection flowing through us as we will die on the cross that we carry. That same power will then flow through us. Because Jesus received, you cannot be raised from the dead unless you die. You have to die daily to receive the resurrection power of Jesus every single day. Woo! All right, so you can't just have the cross and you can't just have the resurrection because Jesus said, you've got to go. Every single born again believer is a sent one. You are sent to go share your testimony. You are sent to go share the gospel, the good news of Jesus. I want you to honestly evaluate how much you share the gospel or how much you share your testimony or how much resurrection power is flowing through you that people can look at your life and know that you are sent from heaven. Let's look at Matthew 28. I'd lied. I do have the Amplified again. Y'all all right? I know it's a lot of scriptures, but it should make you be, when you, when you read scriptures, it should stir up some stuff inside your heart because uh, you can't read that and be, blah. <laughs> Matthew chapter 20. I'm getting there. Sorry. I should have marked it in the Amplified. Huh? I don't like reading it from the board. I hate, I hate having to pause. Yeah, mine's a little bit different because I have the old amplified. Okay, but I say uh, 28 verse 16, sorry. It says, uh, and at that time, oh, no, not, not that. Sorry, that's, verse 20, that's chapter 27. We ain't talking about Barabbas. <laughs> it says, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed and made appointment with them. And when they saw him, they fell down and worshiped. Him, but some doubted. Look at that. They're still doubting before the Spirit of God is released upon them. Isn't that crazy? How did these men? It's crazy. It's because of the Spirit of God. 
Jesus approached him, breaking the silence, said to them, All authority, all power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go then and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you all the days uh, and on every occasion to the very close and consummation of the age. So be it. Now let's go to Mark chapter 16. This is what you know as the Great Commission. The problem is people think the Great Commission went to apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. That would be incorrect. Mark chapter 16, verse 15 says, And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach and publish openly the good news to every creature of the human race. He who believes, who adheres to and trusts and relies on the gospel, and him who it set forth and is baptized, will be saved from the penalty of eternal death. But he who does not believe, who does not adhere to uh, the gospel, will be condemned. And these attesting signs will accompany the fivefold ministry. No. These will follow those who what? Believe. Those who have resurrection life in them. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new languages. They will pick up serpents. And even if they drink anything deadly, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will get well. So then the Lord Jesus, after he'd spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and he sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord kept working with them and confirming the message by the attesting signs and miracles that closely accompanied it. Amen. In John chapter 21, Jesus recalibrating Peter's heart after he had denied him three times, we see Jesus tell Peter, I want you to feed my sheep. I want you to shepherd my sheep. And what he's saying basically, because Peter was the rock that the first church was built upon. And even though John 21 doesn't sound anything like Mark 16 and Matthew 28, it is in essence the Great Commission. Go out and care for my new believers. Feed them and shepherd them and take care of them. In Revelation, we're told that um, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. So sharing our life experience, look, if Jesus doesn't have you excited and you're so far from the BC man that you were, that you forget, remember a couple weeks ago we talked about the leper? If you forget your leper self, you're not going to share that you're healed and set free. But your life should be a testimony that Jesus is working inside of you and you're not the person who used to be in bondage. And when someone says, you're not an alcoholic anymore, how is that? You say, Jesus? You had cancer and you're healed? Yes, Jesus. You weren't able to have children? Yes, Jesus. You have a marriage that is strong and yes, Jesus. We have to go forth and preach the gospel of Jesus. We have to share the good news. Romans chapter 10. Now I think I'm done with the Amplified. <laughs> I didn't mark it. Romans chapter 10, verse 12. He says, So then faith eliminates the distinction between Jew and non-Jew. For he is the same Lord of, for all people. And he has enough treasures to lavish generously upon all who call on him. And it's true. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be rescued and experience new life. But how can people call on him for help if they've not yet believed? And how can they believe in one they've not yet heard of? And how can they hear the message of faith if there is no one there to proclaim it? And how can the message be proclaimed if messengers have yet to be sent? 
That's why the scriptures say, how welcome is the arrival of those proclaiming the joyful news of peace and of good tidings to come. Wow. You have to share your testimony. You have to share the story of good news. Colossians chapter 2. We're about finished. I know you're like, well, yeah, we're still going though. I love Colossians and the Passion Translation. It is fabulous. Colossians chapter 2, verse 26. Oh, that's wrong. Can't be 26. What did I say? I'm in the wrong spot. No, yeah, Colossians chapter 2. Is that the wrong thing? Did I write down the wrong one? Maybe it's 3. Hang on a second. I did write down the wrong one. Well, that's stupid. How could I? We'll just go with the next one. Not a big deal. Sorry. Paul says there in Colossians chapter 2, I forget which verse it is, but he, that he's laboring with intensity to share with others the life of Jesus Christ. He labors with intensity to share the gospel. What about you? Or are you so afraid to share what God has done in your life that you don't say anything anymore? I know some of y'all don't like this, and some of you are bored, but that's fine. Because at the end of the day, I know that the Spirit of God is being poured out, and you're going to be stirred, and you're going to want to experience the resurrection life of Jesus. Because you're not satisfied where you're at. You're not happy. You don't have all the breakthrough that you want. You don't have all the provision that you need. You're not really satisfied. And there's no other way to be satisfied than to be filled with the Holy Ghost and with power. And to commune with the one who created the heavens and the earth. And for him to look at you eyeball to eyeball and breathe life into you and have your mind freaking rocked. Better than any high you could ever snort. I've done all kinds of stuff and Jesus is better than all of it. And maybe you forgot that. Right. Woo, I'm hot. Okay, Matthew, I made me sorry. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 6. Here's the secret. The gospel of grace has made you, non-Jewish believers, into co-heirs of his promise through your union with him. And you've now become members of his body with the anointed one. I have been a, made, a messenger of this wonderful news by the gift of grace that works through me. Even though I'm the least significant of the holy believers, this grace gift has imparted, was imparted when the manifestation of his power came upon me. Grace alone empowers me so that I can boldly preach this wonderful message to non-Jewish people, sharing with them the unfading, inexhaustible riches of Christ, which are beyond comprehension. My passion... Let, let these words sink into your heart. My passion is to enlighten every person to this divine mystery. It was hidden for ages past until now and kept a secret in the heart of God, the creator of all. The purpose, oh, we don't go there. But think about what he says. He said, my passion is to enlighten every person to this divine mystery. What would happen if you walked around like that? That the revelation of God is released when you tell people your story. The gospel of Jesus is full of hope. It is full of hope. When it's released and declared, the spirit of God works behind your words to move on the heart of the person that you're talking to. See, some of you here today have had words deposited to you in the past. Somebody shared the good news to you and you already know that, but today maybe God's watering some things on your life. It may be that now you've already had your seed planted, it's been watered, and now God is bringing you through into the time of harvest and you're going to begin doing the things in the body of Christ that you've always been called to do. 
But none of that could have happened if somebody didn't tell you about Jesus. Somebody had to tell you. Somebody had to show you that Jesus was alive. How many people are around us that are longing for hope, that are longing for joy, who are longing for peace, and we're the answer, but we are too ashamed to open our mouths. Jesus was not ashamed of us on the cross, and we can't be ashamed of him now. Romans chapter 1. We're going to talk about shame. you got to go to Romans chapter 1. Verse 16 and 17. He says, I refuse to be ashamed of sharing the wonderful message of God's liberating power unleashed in us through Christ. For I'm thrilled to preach that everyone who who believes is saved, the Jew first and then the people everywhere. The gospel unveils a continual revelation of God's righteousness, a perfect righteousness given to us when we believe. And it moves us from receiving life through faith to the power of living by faith. Are you just hearing or are you living by faith? It's completely different to live by faith than it is just to know the faith that you have or that you believe in. Your cross necklace isn't enough. Jesus said that the gospel is good news and it is hope, but it must be preached to the whole world before he returns. He didn't mean that prophets, pastors, evangelists, teachers are the only people to share it. We are called... We are supposed to be overflowing with the joy of salvation, bubbling over with hope and excited expectation for what God is doing in the earth today. And if we're not, it's because there's something with us that needs to be fixed. Now I'm closing with these scriptures. Because when I read this this morning, and you may think, I don't even know if that really goes with all that. But you know what? As I read this, I thought, you know, make this our prayer. And I pray that we will be stirred the same way Paul was stirred when he wrote this. He said, so in verse, uh, chapter, I mean, Ephesians 3, verse 14, he says, so I kneel humbly in awe before the father of our Lord Jesus, the Messiah, the perfect father of every father and child in heaven and on earth. I pray we make this our prayer. And I pray that he would unveil within you the unlimited riches of his glory and favor until supernatural strength floods your innermost being with his divine might and explosive power. Then by constantly using your faith, the life of Christ will be released deep inside of you and the resting place of his love will become the very source and root of your life. Then you will be empowered to discover what every Holy One experiences, the great magnitude of the astonishing love of Christ in all its dimensions. How deeply intimate and far-reaching is his love how enduring and inclusive it is. Endless love beyond measurement that transcends our understanding. This extravagant love pours into you until you are filled to overflowing with the fullness of God. Never doubt God's mighty power to work in you and accomplish all of this. takes all three. It takes the cross, it takes the resurrection, and his spirit within us, but it takes us living a life in that resurrection spirit. And until we complete this the way he has predestined and prearranged for us to complete it, he will not return. 
we look to the sky and we hear the promise that Jesus, in the same way that he went up, is going to return. And Jesus is in heaven looking at us and saying, go into all the world and tell them what I did for you. Because I can't come until my bride finishes her assignment. So it's up to us, beloved. I pray with all of my heart that you will be stirred with the power of the resurrection today and that you will remember that he lives in you and he empowers you to live this life the way he lived it and then go share your faith. Just share it. Don't hide it under a bushel. Remember that old song, I won't hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let this light shine. Amen. I love you guys. Happy Resurrection Sunday. Amen. Can we just stand up for a second? I'm going to pray over you, and then we're going to do membership this morning. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Why don't you pray? Let's all bow our heads, please. <clears throat> what's, what's that scripture that it said? And move from receiving power to walking in the power. Can you get it real quick? Let's 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 close out the circle. Well, I don't, I don't want to close out. As Annette was preaching, I, I recognize that there's this impression that's been on me all morning about receiving the word and walking in the word and walking in the power. If you've been here any length of time, you know that we talk about being sons of of God and, and being like God, uh, walking in that power that he gives us, that abundant life. And I started thinking about our life together, Annette and I. We met in McLean Company. Uh, I was trying to get my marriage back together, and she was next while over, and she came and visited Janelle. For those who don't know Janelle, Janelle was like our mom in the spirit, and she was going to do the New Life Fellowship, and she got me to go there, and then she got Annette to go there, and Annette got saved in New Life Fellowship in Belton. But she was a loud mouth, loud woman that would come over to my aisle and talk to Janelle and irritate me because I was quiet and sweet and But as God began to show me that he wasn't putting that back together, that he was bringing me into life with Annette, at the same time, I was seeking God with all my heart and all, all that I had. Everything, morning, noon, and night, I was seeking God and desiring to, to, to do what he wanted me to do. I, I had gone... I had five years old, I came down to the altar and accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I believe I was saved of that day, but throughout my life, I'd never given him my all, because I knew if I give him my all, he was going to make me a pastor or something, and I did not want none of that. I'd be messed up on acid on 6th Street, and we'd start going in a bar, and I would hear the Holy Spirit press on me, don't go in there. All through my life, God was with me. But as I was going through that divorce and seeking God with all my heart and God was showing me that this was dead and that he was bringing it to life, I, as that passion went, I was a Baptist boy that didn't know nothing about all this, this God movement and this power. But there's a thing about receiving God and receiving uh, eternal life and hoping one day I'll go to heaven and receiving that power power that raised Jesus from the dead. It's the same thing. It's just allowing it to transfer from receiving it to walking in it. And as I was praying and reading and listening to the word, we were pursuing. And the miraculous started happening. And I, you don't recognize it unless you stop and pay attention. I was upset about Ashlyn. She was I was going to, we were going to be divorced and she was going to be raised, raised up in a broken home. And that just, I did not want that. And uh, Tim McGraw had a song about 
don't lose the girl, something like that. Don't take the girl. And that was, I listened to country back then, and I still do. And uh, I was listening to that song, and I just started thinking about Ashley, and I was crying. And I, when I would get home, I would call Annette and say, I'm home. And she's half, she had already fallen asleep, which she did most nights on me. She'd fall asleep. We'd be talking, and I would say, Annette, 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 Annette. But as soon as she picked up the phone, she said, God said, she's, gonna, she's okay. He's got her. I didn't say anything to her. I didn't, she didn't know anything about that song. She didn't know anything about what was going on in me. But the Holy Spirit moved. That's just a little thing. But that was the power of the Holy Ghost operating in two people. And everywhere we go and everywhere we do, when we're pursuing him and we're, lot, we're receiving God and then walking in that power, miracles happen. Money comes from nowhere. People are, rece- are, are saved. People are changed. People are healed. Uh, words are come from nowhere. We, we, we know people's issues. We'll walk in a room and the anointing hits them and they begin to come to us and, 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 and repent and, and talk to us. And all of that happens Every day of our lives and when we walk in resurrection power. Amen. And that's what I want. That, you know, I want to raise the dead. I want to open the ear. I want to open the eye. I want to allow someone that, that is broken to bring them to life. I want someone that is poor to come to riches. And that happens when we're daily constantly in contact with him. It happens all around us. And Think about when you first got excited about Jesus, how those little things happened everywhere you turned. You would come to church and someone would tell you something. I would preach something. You are you in my? You know how many times I've heard somebody? Were you in my closet? Did you hear? Did you hear our conversation? No, that's God talking to you. And I just felt like there's a lot of people in here today that have, have. used to have that and don't have it anymore. And I think that's what today's message is about, is to getting back to that resurrection life. Amen? Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, just I pray, Father, that we would partake of your word and allow and receive it into our heart. Let it become faith and operate in it, Father. Walk in that miraculous power to bring a word to someone of encouragement, to bring the money that they need, to bring the healing that they need, to see people's lives changed forevermore, and to be excited about it again, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Who is joining the church this morning? Adam? Octavia? Come on up, both of you. Elders, come on around them. All right. Elders, come on. Elders, pastors, let's go. Come on. Well, get up. Stand and look at me. I'm going to knock you out, woman. Okay, everybody, everybody else. You know how we do. Come on, everybody, get around them. Lay hands on them. I'm always around the circle, outside, speaking life. Fighting off the, the evil ones like a net. I'll knock you out. I'll knock you out. All right, someone put some oil on them. Lather them up. Okay. Don't move too fast now. All right, dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today, and and Father, in this place, we believe that you place members within the body. Uh, Father, every one of us has a function in the body of Christ. You said that Jesus was the head, and the rest of us are the body, and we make up that body. And and as we look at a, a physical body, we have fingers and hands and toes and feet and arms and buttocks and chest and all the things that we have, the body, all have functions, all have purpose, all have have, uh, 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 
things that they bring to the body to help it to walk and move and breathe. And, and so, Father, each place is important as the foot, and the eye, the mouth. Every piece has its value. And, Father, my heart's desire is that we would listen to you, hear your voice, and know where you want us. Whether it's the First Baptist down the street or if it's the Point Christian Fellowship. And this, this morning, these two young men, mighty men of God, have received your word and, and, and received what you have communicated to their hearts. And they've, they say, this is where God wants me. So, Father God, we celebrate that today. We say thank you. We, we praise you, Father, for that you're uh, uh, placing with this, replenishing, Father God. What the enemy has stolen, they're bringing forth back double fold, Father God. And we thank you for it. And we praise you for it. Now, Father God, as they have yielded to your word and yielded to your voice, we ask for your favor and your blessing to come upon them. We ask that the word become alive, that every time they read, every time they pray, Father God, it would multiply in their hearts and in their lives, Father God. We ask that you would bring down financial blessing upon them, Father God. Pour into them, press down, shaken together, and overflowing, Father God. We ask for revelation and understanding in the word, Father God. We ask for the anointing. We ask for the Holy Spirit to move and operate through them, that they hear the voice of the Lord, that they see the direction of God, that they, Father God, operate in the power of God. And then, Father God, we just ask that you bless them mightily, Father God. We ask that extension go to the the, uh, outer uh, parts of their family, Father God, and just pour down, press down, shaking together, pouring over, Father God. Father God, I ask as you speak to the hearts and what you've called them to do. Let the elders recognize that, Father God, and empower us to equip them, Father God, to come alongside them, to encourage them to do, Father God, what they're called to do in this body, Father. We just ask, Father God, that you seal this commitment today with your blood, Father God, uh, the blood of your Son. And that, Father God, the same way that they come in, Father God, if you to, to send them somewhere else, Father God, the same way that they come in, Father God, we pray, I pray earnestly that we will do the same in sending them forth. And so, Father God, we say thank you and, and, and praise you. We just ask that you seal it today, Father God, and bless them. And we thank you, Father, again. And, Father God, just encourage them. Let them know that the, let their eyes be open to receiving fully that word. It becoming part of them and then allowing that blood, that power of the Holy Spirit to bring resurrection life. And they operate in that, Father, fullness. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Adam, I know that the Lord has been showing you that there's things that you have to do, but I feel it's going to be fine-tuned. And I hear him say, allow people that have what you need to speak into your life. He's going to cut on you. There's going to be some cutting, a two-edged sword, but he's equipping you and preparing you. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, I have a word for each of you. Um, Octavia, I was, I was remembering when my daughter, when she was younger, and I would pray over her. And um, uh, oh, one night she was out, and uh, I kind of, I thought maybe she was up to some mischief. Mis- mischief and uh, the Lord showed me this umbrella open up over her, and he told me that he had her. He, he reminded me then that, you know, because of our connection with Jesus as parents, that God was protecting her as well. And what I saw was that umbrella pop open over you today and that there are some things that you have longed for in your life. And the Lord said that because you got under 
that umbrella because I know it seems like not a big deal, but when we join ourselves to a body, we are actually aligning ourselves up with the glory of God. And there are, you're going to see some things that you have longed for. I don't know what they are. I kind of have a suspicion, but there's some, there's been some longings of your heart that the Lord says, be prepared because now that you're in that alignment with me, I'm going to be able to flow out the blessings that I have, that you have longed for and that I have longed for. Amen. In Jesus name. Um, And Adam, I, This is going to sound a little crazy, but um, I see you like a corner piece, uh, like a a straight piece on a puzzle. And um, oh, I got goosebumps. Lord have mercy. Okay. Uh, You have, you do have a call in your life. You know that already. You know that. And you have been through all kinds of warfare because of it. Some of it, you weren't even aware why some of the struggle you had was from a spiritual root, but God says he has predestined you to be formed into the image of Jesus Christ, just like he has all of his sons and daughters. But you have a place of um, where you, you're you going to bring structure to the body of Christ. Uh, that's why you're an, you're an edge piece, you know what I mean? Like you're, there is, and it's been missing um, and the Lord has called you here, um, and he says to, um, to hear, to listen, to be equipped, to be, like he said, cut on a minute ago. There, there are seasons of circumcision of our heart, but the Lord says, fret not, you will heal quickly, but there's a season of cutting, there's a season of healing, but when you are finished with that, there is going to be just a new glory and a new manifestation of his power working in your life. Um, he's going to bless the work of your hands. He's going to bless the anointing and the words of your mouth. And there is a quieting peace that is coming to your mind where the warfare and the turmoil has caused your thoughts to go a little bit crazy. Sometimes the Lord says, I'm bringing peace to it because as you find that place where you fit alongside others, you're going to receive the calming presence of the spirit of the living God. Amen. Octavian, uh, before she took the thing, I wanted to say to you, you're tall in the spirit, not only in the physical, but I, I don't know if your personality is wild and crazy outside of here, but God is establishing you to be a, a, a man of wisdom, tall and a pillar in the, in, in the church and standing firm and speaking wisely. Uh, as he fills you up, you're going to receive it and, and, and people aren't going to recognize the wisdom that comes out of your mouth uh, of knowing the word. And the Lord's establishing that in you, uh, standing tall, above, head above most people, but quiet and reserved and humble in that position. Octavian, what I heard was the Lord said that your namesake does not define you, but your namesake gives you access. And it actually was, as soon as I touched you, he gave it to me. But the Lord showed me what Pastor Rick and Pastor Annette just said over you is your influence that you have, that you had before, is of no comparison to what you have now. So all of your family that um, they were waiting, they may not, not have ever said anything, but it reminded me of when my cousin Flo first stepped out to start preaching Jesus so boldly, it gave a lot of us access to not be ashamed of it anymore. And I see you stepping out like that and and absolutely being an umbrella for other people to feel safe to come up underneath you and follow him to where they won't be ashamed to either. Adam, uh, this morning I was getting dressed and I heard your name and the Lord told me, I want you to tell him um, that he is one like Zacchaeus. And I was like, well, Lord, Zacchaeus was a little man. He said, no, I want you to focus on that Zacchaeus did not care what the people said. And he climbed higher to see Jesus because he knew as long as he set his eyes on him and he could see where he was. And in that was an invitation. And the Lord, and the Lord is saying to you today that he saw you climb higher and he has invited himself to you. And, and that is such a big, bold move because just like uh, Pastor, and Pastor Rick and Pastor Nett said, that it is confirming to me that you are a man of influence, but the Lord will bridle you and he will be the one that will pull you back and let you go and you're going to be okay every time. It's almost like he's going to grab you by the collar and you're going to be okay with that because you know if he's got you that he is the one that's leading you and he's the one that's moving you. So you will be okay with being bridled. You will be okay with saying not now and to just wait because it is 
you will always climb higher to see the Jesus in every situation. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Just seal this with your, your, your precious Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Shake hands, hug next. Don't get mixed up. We'll see you Tuesday for Gatesville, Wednesday for Temple. We love you. Oh, shame is a prison. It's cruel.